morning to you, brothers and sisters. I greet you all in the name of our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's good to see you all this morning. Let me give a warm welcome to our visitors this morning and say that we are honored to have you come and worship the Lord with us this morning. And I trust that you will have a blessed time while worshiping the Lord with us this morning. And I have the privilege of bringing to you God's message from his holy, his holy book, the Bible. Uh, turn with me to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Now, this morning, I thought to take a break from the New Testament books and do an exposition of one of David's uh, Psalms. If you remember that in the New Testament, James has been our focus for many months. Um, and, but today, I sense that the Lord wants to teach us uh, something from David's prayer of lament in Psalm 3. And I think we can learn a lot from David's uh, experience in the Psalms. And today's message I titled, Sleep in the Mist of Storms. And it's, it's a borrowed title, Sleep in the Mist of Storms. Now, if you are not there already, turn in your copies of God's Word to Psalm 3, and let us hear what the Lord has to say to us through his servant, David. Psalm 3, reading from the ESV. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings be on your people. Let me pray for us. O oh Lord, we, we thank you once again this morning that we are gathered here to worship you. And Lord, as we get to this pinnacle of the worship, which is the preaching of your word, we pray that, Lord, you will continue to be with us, and you will help us, O oh Lord, to um, remain focused as we go through your weight. Lord, we pray that you will help me as I give this message to your people this morning, that you will strengthen me. In your name I pray. Amen. So from the reading, I think you will see that it's clear that the author of the psalm is David. So the psalm is a lament or a prayer of lament. It is the first of many lament psalms and it is said that lament psalms are complaints through prayer in which the author or the writer calls out to God for help in times of suffering, times of frustrations, times of danger, war, sickness, persecution, etc. And here in the psalm, David's situation has been described in the heading of the psalm. And now if you use, if you use um, any of the vernacular translations, you would notice that the English um, translation, the verses structure is a bit different. 
what you see as the heading in the English Bible, it will be verse 1 in the Africans, in your Sesotho, Sikosa, and Isizulu languages. So I just thought I should make you uh, aware of that. So in verse 1, we see David's situation, and it's clear that there that he is definitely not having a good time. He is fleeing from danger. And we'll shortly unpack the events around him at the time of the writing of this uh, prayer of lament. But before we go into those events, I want um, to first show you what we observe from this psalm. And uh, we observe the, the, the following. We observe three pieces of evidence that God saves so that you may trust him during adversity. Three pieces of evidence that God saves so that you may trust him during adversity. Remember, those times of adversities already have mentioned them in the, this uh, definition of the uh, um, lament psalm. The first is that God protects the afflicted. And we see that in verse 3 and verse 4. And the second evidence is that God sustains the afflicted. That we see again in verse 3 and verse 6. The third is that God delivers the afflicted. That will be the last three verses, verse 6 to verse 8. Those are the observations I want to make this morning from this beautiful psalm of David. And I hope that the observations will become apparent to you or clear to you as we study the psalm together. Now, David starts this um, lament by requesting God's attention. And this is the pattern you would observe in the lament psalms. The author starts first by requesting the audience with God. And in the psalm, David does so by addressing God with his personal name, Yahweh or Jehovah. That is the covenant name of the God of Israel. And David, in addressing God with this name, demonstrates that he knows God and that he is known by God. And he has a special relationship with him. Yahweh is his God and he is his worshiper. He is the worshiper of Yahweh and the servant of this God. He worships and he serves Yahweh. As David requests Jehovah's witness, uh, attention, sorry, he immediately draws the Almighty's uh, attention to his problem or his problems. Now, David is alarmed by the growing list of his enemies. And he sounds overwhelmed to see that so many are conspiring against him. Many are seeking after his life. That is how David describes to God the difficult situation in which he finds himself. If you remember, David, he was a man who had many enemies in his, probably in his whole life. He was a man who was constantly fighting battles, he was constantly in wars. At times his enemies would pursue him, and at times he would be the one who pursues them. David was a warrior, even from his shepherd days. As a young boy, he was already a brave warrior. Remember, he overcame those um, <coughs> predators or lions who wanted to uh, attack his uh, flock and he even overcame Goliath at his young age. He was relatively young when he defeated Goliath. Now in the context, new on his enemy's list is his, is, is his own son. His own son by the name of Absalom. The story is captured for us in 2 Samuel chapter 15, and I'll ask you to turn there and put one finger in 2 Samuel 15 as we'll be going back and forth between 
um, Samuel, 2 Samuel 15 and um, Psalm 3. But for the sake of time, we would not read the entire story. So you can read it on your time at home just to appreciate the, the, the context of Psalm 3. Just to give you a brief summary of David's situation, his son Absalomon for four years had been discreetly stealing the hearts or winning over the hearts of the men of Israel. And without David's knowledge, without his father knowing, and in those four years, his son had been offering to the people him, himself, offering himself to the people by saving them as they come um, in and out to come see the king. But he was the one who was attending to them. And he was presenting himself as this caring and loving judge. And he succeeded in stealing their hearts. For we read in the following verse, um, in verse 13 of Second uh, Samuel 15, verse 13 it says, And a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Absalom. After hearing this shocking news, David had no option but to flee for his life because Absalom was coming to take, to take away not only his crown, not only his crown, but his life too. And we see in verse 14 that David um, indeed flee. Because he said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly, and bring down ruin on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And we see David did exactly that. He flee with some of his servants who were relatively few in number compared to many who were with Absalom. This was a heart-wrenching moment for David. For we read later in verse 30, from verse 30, that, but David went up to the ascent of Mount Olives, weeping as he went. You see, this, this was a very emotional time for him. He was weeping. He was barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and they went up weeping as they went. That's the setting of our psalm. And David was, as we saw, he was in great grief. And it is believed that at the summit of this holy hill, Mount Olive, it is where David com composed this comfortable psalm. And he laments to God the fact that his life is in danger. And this problem, this problem he's facing is compounded by the fact that these conspirators, these people who are after him, after his life, are actually casting aspersions against God's power, either verbally so or through their actions. And according to David, they are doubting if God can really save. They are doubting if God can really save or help David from his, this distressing situation. And you see in verse 2, they, 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 they would say there is no salvation for him in God. There is no salvation for David in God. Now since the psalm setting is a combat or is, is, is war, some translation use the word help like your New King James, instead of salvation, they will say help, which is very, which is very helpful on its, in, in itself in, because in the context, after all, what David is looking for from God is, is help. He wants to be rescued. He's fleeing, he's running away from danger, and he knows that um, his son would be pursuing him. And he wants... David wants to prevail against his enemies. 
He physically wanted God to rescue him. Now this big, this, 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 this um, big problem is that if, if David cannot find help in God, where else can he go for help? It would mean that God whom David worshipped is weak. He is merciless. He is uncaring, not by showing um, this uh, who against him that God has done this for him. From verse 3, the David starts giving sharp contrast between what is alleged about God and what he knows personally about God. In the main, in the, main the, the contrast there is between evil and good. It is the contrast between godly, the godly David and the ungodly Absalom. Father and son are at war. Now, if you think of it, this is, this is the fulfillment of Nathan's prophecy about David's house, that the sweat shall not depart from his house, that we also see in 2 Samuel 12, meaning fighting will continue in his family. <clears throat> And this is the beginning of that um, fulfillment of that prophecy, as we know. And it will only get worse in later generations. In verse 3, David starts to show that contrary to the untruths, to the lies said about God, that God indeed saves the afflicted like, like him. And he lists these pieces of evidence of God dealing with him in the past. Firstly, then verse 3, David affirms that God protects because he is David's shield. God is my shield. And when you jump to verse 4, you will see exactly how the shield has protected David before. David recounts the time when he cried aloud to the Lord. And he says, the Lord answered me. And I say, Recount because from the reading it appears that this is a past occurrence when David was probably in a similar distressing situation as the current one because he says there that he had received an answer to his prayer. So he's stating that he cried for God's protection in the past and he received it. This is to show that God does protect his loved one. And if he's able to protect them from harm, it proves that he can save their soul from eternal destruction. As we continue to observe, secondly, we, 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 um, in verse 5, we see that not only does God protect the afflicted, but he sustains the afflicted. This is another piece of evidence that God saves he helps. In verse 3, we see David as affirming his trust in God because the Lord, as he says, is his glory, is my glory and the lifter of my head. Now, to say that God is your glory is to mean that he is your honor. God is your, 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 your dignity. And at this moment of his prayer, David's glory had been taken away through his son's actions. David, the, the strong man, just think about it. David, the strong man, David, the king, is almost dethroned by his son. He's even fleeing barefooted while weeping like a child robbed of his lollipop by a bully. He's like a, a defeated dog with its tail between his, uh, the legs. David is disgraced. He is the disgraced king. Hence, he has his head covered 
and dropped as he flees. He's literally covered in shame. There's no palace for him. There's no army. Therefore, there's no security. There's no pomp for him. But who does he have? Who does David have at this point? He has God. And he says, God is his glory. I believe that verse 5, David with his personal experience, his personal experience we've been um, mentioning, he reminds himself and those listening to him as he prays of how God has restored his glory to him in the past. And figuratively, he shows that at his moment of weakness, when he, when he was vulnerable as someone who's down on, on, on the floor asleep, the Lord restored his glory to him. He brought his temporary lost dignity back. The Lord has vindicated him before his enemies because, because of this sustenance, he was able to wake up again from the shame. For indeed, adversity can cause us shame. And he writes somewhere in another psalm, um, Psalm 7, 5, and he says, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. The Lord literally became the lifter of his head. He lifted him out of affliction, which overpowered him and caused his head to drop due to grief and shame. That's like what we say uh, today to help him keep his head just above the waters or just above the water in order to survive. According to David, only God is able to do so. He can entirely take away his present uh, griefs to reinstate him to his former happy and honorable condition. Now, brothers and sisters, get, get God, sorry, God can do this for you if you are afflicted. And he can do it in many ways. Firstly, if God does not take the grief or pain away from you, he can make you be at peace with the pain or the grief. He can make you sleep in the middle of storms. And that's always a tough one to, to cancel, especially from the pastors. It's difficult to, ca to cancel that situation where the pain, the grief is not going away. God says it will stay. To make the counselee understand that, but God can give you peace to, to go through this grief. Now, at times, God can prolong the, the pain and the grief, or the grief, which is another tough one to deal with. But be, be assured that at the end, God will use, will use you, will use you to comfort others who would be afflicted. And we get this from 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. When your grief when your pain ends, God will use you to comfort those who go through a similar affliction or pain or grief. If he responds by taking it away, he, he then or he then blesses you with good things for his glory. That one is meant to be the easy one because then we should be we should be rejoicing with the dear brother or sister by this, this positive answered prayer, by this new found victory or joy. But then it also becomes problematic because at the end, that becomes the standard. People will think that every time when I'm in pain or grief, God should come through for me. He should answer me positively. 
It's not always the case. It's not always the case. So far, brothers and sisters, between verse 3 and 6, I believe you have observed David's statement of trust to God or in God. This is his affirmation that his trust is in God and it's based on what God did for him in the past. And this trust is unwavering. It's regardless of how many enemies are pursuing him. David says he will never be afraid because in his corner, he has God. He has the most powerful in his corner. His God would never fail him. In God, victory is guaranteed. And shortly, we'll see how God is going to deal with these many thousands of enemies who are pursuing David. But lastly, in verse 7 and 8, or 6, 7 and 8, we note our last piece of evidence that God saves the afflicted. God saves the afflicted. So let me say verse 7 and 8. God delivers the afflicted. He delivers them from danger. Verse 7 and verse 8. Since, since David has much confidence in the Lord for protecting him and sustaining him on his past ordeals or on his past um, distressing situation, he concludes the lament psalm by requesting the Lord for help. And he directly requests the Lord to save him from the present situation. David pleads with, with God to arise. He's requesting God to take up his position as the mighty warrior of Israel, to defend his servant since his enemies are ready to strike. Now David understood that the Lord was Israel's defender from the ungodly people. He confirms this fact in one of his Psalms later, that Psalm 28, 24, verse 8, and he says, Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Now no army can defeat the Lord. Regardless of its size, against the Lord, thousands have fallen. And many of these victories, David would have been the leading general in those battles. He knows, he has tasted the Lord's deliverance many times. He has done so many times against his enemies, like the Philistines and many other nations. Now with the latest threat from his son, David understood that as the Lord's anointed, whoever touched him, without the Lord's permission, was guilty before the Lord. Hence, he lays the problem directly at the Lord's feet. Only in the Lord can this, um, can the Lord, sorry, only the Lord can save the anointed king from the danger and embarrassment. According to David, this young man, Absalom, must face a fitting punishment from the Lord. He must pay for his sins, if you like, for wanting to depose the divinely appointed king of Israel. For this grave mistake, David is requesting God for deliverance from him, which equates to defeat for Absalom and all his many accomplices. Now, because God defeats the, the wicked and deals harshly with them, and that's the meaning of that uh, um, strong figurative language we see in verse 7, that striking of the cheek, the, the breaking of the teeth, that's punishment language. And David requests God to deliver him based on his unwavering knowledge and believe that deliverance or salvation belongs to the Lord. David knows that God is the author of salvation. It is owned by nobody but him. Now, this is the truth 
which is repeated, you can say, at least 70 times in the Psalms. Psalm 37, 39 says, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. Now, that's another proof that, indeed, God saves, God helps, he saves the righteous. And shortly, in our application points, we'll elaborate on that salvation of the righteous, especially. And I think to conclude our observation from the psalm, last in verse 8, we know that David is not only praying for his safety and salvation, he is concerned about the people. He's concerned about their salvation, and he praised God for, for pouring his blessings on the people of Israel. This shows that David is a caring and a loving leader of the people. Unlike Absalom, he intercedes for the people. And unlike Absalom, he, he's genuinely concerned about the welfare of the people. And as I prayed, I think earlier, this is a lesson to first to us spiritual leaders that we must not or we, we must save and care for the people of God and not be obsessed with positions and, and, and offices in the church. Because secular, secular leaders, politicians, especially here in the country, we pray that this message reaches them too while they're busy negotiating, power sharing, deals behind closed doors. Some of those deals you might never know of or know about. What must be first and foremost in their minds should be the people's welfare. They must all work together towards the prosperity of all, not just few, towards justice, prosperity for all. Now to conclude, We've seen David has shown us these three pieces of evidence that the Lord does save because the Lord has done it for him. And he's proving to his detractors, those who are pursuing his enemies, that this is what the Lord has done for me. Here, this is the, this is the proof, this is the evidence. And it is, this evidence is for you to know that the Lord will save you in your affliction so that you may trust him during adversity. He protects, he sustains, and he delivers the afflicted from danger. In application, this truth teaches you a believer. I think the following three broad um, truths, and I've borrowed this from Dr. Barak, Barik. The first one is when true, when oh, sorry, when trouble comes, get in the habit of going to God. That's the first one. When trouble comes, get in the habit of going to God. I think they normally say, if you are physically sick, you consult the doctor. If you are physically sick, you consult the doctor, and we have the doctor here among us. Now, should you not do the same when we are spiritually sick? Should you not do the same when trouble visits us? And I've made this point that if you are a Christian, you must accept that trouble will visit you at some point in your life. And during that time when, when trouble, trouble visits you, the devil and the ungodly people around you would, would give you doubts about God being the right place for consultation. They will make you doubt consulting with God. You will, you will be given advice to consult all over but God. For your anxiety attacks, you will be given advice to consult 
some way. For your depression problems, you'll be given advice to go some way. For your marital or parental challenges, you'll be, you'll be given advice to go some way. For your guilt, because of your ungodly lifestyle choices, because of ungodly influences in your life, you would be given advice to go some way. For your future plans, for many, many, many other troubles, those around you, ungodly, would give you advice to go some way. Your pastors would most, in most cases, be the last person or the last people to be consulted. Learn to go to God first. Then go to his people to counsel and support. His people are your pastors, your brothers and sisters around you. Because we are all capable of helping one another. We are all capable of helping one another through this book. Now, the second main point of application is the Lord is worthy of trust. Therefore, we must trust him. And it's straightforward. The, worth, the Lord is worthy of trust. Therefore, we must trust him. The Lord is faithful. Therefore, you must trust him during, during your big and small troubles. During your complicated and easy matters. You must trust the Lord. Our failures to trust God with our problems, with our griefs and troubles, is direct causes of some of our physical ailments, ailments if not all of our physical ailments. ailments. Our failure to, to come to God is the cause of some of those physical ailments. And number three, which is the last one, salvation is from the Lord. He alone can save us from sin. Salvation is from the Lord. He alone can save us from sin. Now, salvation, here we refer to rescue from eternal life, not rescue from physical, as David was um, praying, has been pursued, pursued, but here we talk about salvation from eternal punishment, which is hell. Because we know that the wages of sin is death. Now this too is from the Lord. And Peter and the apostles, when they were preaching the gospel, they said this to the, the, um, the leaders of Israel. He said to them in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, they said, this, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which became or becomes the cornerstone. Verse 12, very important. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, without believing in Jesus, who was crucified by these ungodly leaders of Israel, and after three days, God raised him from the dead. He is the one who has borne your sinful griefs and carried your sorrows. Jesus was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. It is through his wounds that we are healed. It is through Jesus' wounds that we are healed. In short, he died to take away your big problem. And your big problem is sin. And if you believe that he is your savior, that he resurrected to give you victory against sin and death, which is your biggest enemy now if you are not saved, if you believe this about him, you would have life eternal in his name. You will have life in abundance. The Bible says that. And you will be given righteousness. You will become the righteous because of his 
work on the cross. And at last, I'll ask us to stand up and, and sing that salvation belongs to the Lord because salvation is from God. It belongs to him. So please rise to sing salvation belongs to the Lord. <laughs>